Hello, I'm Kirk Weiler, and this is Common Core Algebra 2 by eMath Instruction. Today, we'll be doing Unit 8, Lesson Number 4, More Work with Fractional Exponents. So we saw fractional exponents way back in the exponential and logarithmic unit, um, and we tried to make some sense of them using exponent laws. In this lesson, what I'd like to do is review the basic concept of a fractional exponent and then get into some applications with them. Let's jump right in and look at unit fractional exponents. All right, so if you recall, we define b to the 1 over n, so when we raise a number or a variable to 1 over n, where n is some positive integer, then we define that to be the nth root of b. So for example, if we have 25 to the 1 half, that is the square root of 25. If we have 8 to the 1 third, that's the cubed root of 8. If we have 64 to the 1 fourth, that's the fourth root of 64. All right, so this is really amazing. Clearly, roots and powers have a connection to each other, right? The square root is the opposite of the squaring. Um, the cube root is the opposite or the inverse of cubing. So it kind of makes sense then that roots could be symbolized or denoted by fractional exponents. Let's get into a problem that deals with these unit fraction exponents. All right, exercise one. Rewrite each expression in the form of a times x to the b, where a and b are both rational numbers. One more time. We're going to rewrite each one of these expressions into the form a times x to the b, where a and b are both rational numbers. So letter a is actually, letter a is really simple. That is just going to be 5 times x to the 1 half, right? a and b, and they're both rational numbers. Now letter b is a little bit more challenging, right? In fact, we may want to rewrite this as, at first as 1 fourth times the fifth root of x. Once we've done that, we can then rewrite this fifth root of x as x to the 1 fifth. All right, even more challenging is this problem. Right Here we have 7 divided by the cubed root of x. But I'm going to look at it like this, 7 times 1 divided by the cubed root of x. But 1 divided by the cubed root of x is 1 divided by x to the 1 third. And then this is 7 times x to the negative 1 third. Now, many students will be able to immediately go right there. And that's okay, right? But we want to make sure that, that people are really seeing this correctly. Let's take a look at the last one. Oh, this one looks horrible. Look at that. Like numbers everywhere. 5, 3, 10, x, square root. Not square root, 10th root. Again, very similar to the last one. I want to rewrite this as 5 thirds times 1 divided by the 10th root of x. All right, so very, very similar to what I did here. And then I'm going to write that as 5 thirds times 1 over x to the 1 tenth, which is going to be 5 thirds times x to the negative 1 tenth. All right, eventually we're going to talk about what are called power functions, and these are examples of power expressions, at least, if not functions, because there's no y equals. Um, but it's important for you to be able to take quantities that involve square roots or cubed roots or fourth roots or fifth roots or tenth roots or whatever and write them so that there are no roots left but only exponents. And we'll see the way that is in, in coming lessons, including this one. Pause the video now and write down anything you need to. All right. Let's clear this out and review another important thing about exponents. So what happens when we don't have a unit fractional exponent? What happens when we have x to the 3 halves or x to the 5 thirds? Well, in this case, what happens is that the denominator of the power indicates the root. And the numerator of the power, well, it indicates what we normally think of as a power. The beautiful thing is it can be done in either order. So in other words, we could first 
take b and raise it to the m and then take the nth root, or we could first take b and take the nth root and then raise it to the mth, 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 that sounds weird, mth power, mth, anyway, whatever. Um, besides my, my problem pronouncing that word, um, and now, which, which order should you do it in really depends on the problem, the context, what you're trying to do. Are you evaluating something without a calculator, etc.? All right. So let me clear that out. And then let's play around with this a little bit. All right. Let exercise two. Rewrite each of the following root power root combinations as a rational exponent in simplest form. All right. In simplest form. So for instance, x to the seventh underneath the square root can be thought of as x to the seventh to the one half and then we can use that great property of exponents that says we just multiply the exponents together so we get x to the seventh half, seven halves on the other hand the fourth root of x to the sixth we can think about that as x to the sixth raised to the one fourth but then that's going to be x to the sixth fourths which is the same as x to the 3 halves. Why don't you go ahead and do letter C and letter D? Now letter C is kind of cool because that really works out ni nice. We have the square root of x to the 6th and that's going to be x to the 3rd, right? Because we just multiply those two. And the final one, there actually was no simplification involved. We have x to the one-third raised to the tenth, so that's going to be x to the ten-thirds. And that's it, right? So fractional exponents, really, are combinations of roots and what you would just normally think of as powers, okay? So we're going to get a little bit more of a workout with this as we go on. Pause the video now, and then I'll clear out the text. Okay, here it goes. All right, let's tackle a couple more problems with fractional exponents, and then we're going to use them in order to simplify radicals. Exercise number three. If f of x equals 10 times x to the 3 halves minus 24 times x to the negative 1, then which of the following represents the value of f of 4? Find the value without the use of your calculator. Show steps in your calculation. Now again, it's many students will say, why can't I just use my calculator? It's going to make it much easier. And the answer is, you, it absolutely would make it easier. No question about it. But the point is, by using your calculator, you really miss learning anything there is about either fractional or negative exponents. So pause the video now and see if you can evaluate f of 4 without touching your calculator. Now, once you're done, if you then want to use your calculator to check your answer, I would certainly encourage that. Go ahead and pause the video now. Okay, let's go through it. Well, what do we have? We've got f of 4. Oh, I have a pen that's not working. We have f of 4, which is 10 times 4 to the 3 halves minus 24 times 4 to the negative 1. And notice how I put those 4s in parentheses. All right. It's important to remember that we're going to do this exponent before we multiply by 10. Now, what does that exponent tell us? Well, it says that we should be taking the square root of 4, and then we should be cubing it. And we'll deal with that in a second. Now, what does this one say? Well, this really says that we should be multiplying by 1 fourth. Let's keep going. Square root of 4 is 2, and eventually I'll cube that. And of course here, 1 fourth of 24 is just 6. Now of course 2 cubed, 2 times 2 times 2, is 8. And now my order of operations say I should do the 8 times the 10 minus the 6. And that gets me that 74. Choice 4. Again, can one do this on the calculator? Sure. If I was on a standardized exam and I had my calculator, might I do this on the calculator? Maybe. Maybe. But the idea here is that we try to master our exponents and what they mean. Plus, you could always put it in incorrectly in your calculator. 
All right, pause the video now, write down anything you need to, and then we'll move on to one more multiple choice problem. Okay, let's clear out the text. All right, exercise four, which of the following is not equivalent to x to the minus seven thirds? Not equivalent. All right, well, what I'd like you to do is really take a look at that problem and see if you can find one that is not equivalent to that. Well, this one might be kind of easy because one of these sort of doesn't look like the other. But let's, let's play around with it for a bit. x to the negative 7 thirds. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of that negative exponent by rewriting it as x to 1 divided by x to the positive 7 thirds, which means this is all good. That's not the correct answer. All right. At the same time, what this really represents is a cubed root and a seventh power. All right, so we could either look at it like this, or we could look at it like this. Now, I look at these choices, well, this is definitely one of them, all right? Then it's kind of like, well, which one of these things do I eliminate? Well, notice this is still a cubed root, right? This is a seventh root. We have no seventh root going on here. We've got no x cubed. So this is actually the one that isn't equivalent to it. And this should really be choice four. That's a little weird. Let's see if I can remember to correct that. Now this one, by the way, is equivalent because if we had the cubed root of one divided by x to the seventh, we had this property the other day that said that we could just apply the exponent to both the numerator and the denominator cube root of 1 is 1, so that is still the same thing, all right, even though it looks considerably different. All right, well, pause the video now, write down anything you need to, and then we're going to move on to simplifying radicals. Okay, let's clear out the text. Now, back in Algebra 1, you spend some time simplifying square roots. We want to take a look at the basis for why you can simplify square roots today, and then we're going to take it up a little bit of a notch, and we're going to simplify square roots that have, that have variables underneath the square root, and then we'll also simplify third roots, fourth roots, etc. All right? Now, let's take a look at the basis for why we can simplify a square root. Exercise number five, letter A, says fill in the property below a times b all raised to the n equals what? So this is one of the properties we had in the previous lesson. Why don't you fill that in? All right, well, it's, it's very simple. Way, way more room than we need here. We'll take up a bunch of room. It's going to be a to the n times b to the n. So if we have a product inside of an exponent, that exponent applies to both part of the products. Letter B says rewrite square root of 28 in factored form, with one factor being the largest perfect square divisor. Also write the square root in exponent form. All right, well, perfect squares, numbers like 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, etc. The largest one of these that's a divisor of 28 happens to be 7. So we can write the square root of 28 as the square root of 4 times 7. But we could also write it as 4 times 7 to the 1 half. Now that's all, I, that's all it asked me to do. Just rewrite 28, right? And rewrite the square root as a fractional exponent. But now we can, let me put quotes around that, simplify. We can now simplify the square root of 28 by saying, well, all right, 4 times 7 to the 1 half must be 4 to the 1 half times 7 to the 1 half. 4 to the 1 half is the square root of 4. 7 to the 1 half is the square root of 7. I can't really do anything with this, but the square root of 4 I can write as 2. So what does this really say? Right, Because square roots are exponents, what it really says 
is that if I break the quantity underneath the square root up into a product, I can simply then take the square root of each part of the product and multiply them together. One can extend this to any root, so if I have a third root, a fourth root, a fifth root, it doesn't matter. Because they're all exponents, I can just apply the exponent to each part of that product. And this then serves as the basis for simplifying square roots and higher order roots. So take a moment, pause the video, and write down anything you need to. All right, I'm going to clear out the text. Exercise 6. Simplify each of the following square roots. Show the manipulations that lead to your answer. All right, so the key with square roots is keeping these numbers in mind. 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, 49, 64, 81, 100, 121, what was that, 144, 169, etc. It's pretty rare that you have to dig this deep, but you never know. So 18x to the fourth. Now, you certainly simplified root 18 back in Common Core Algebra 1, but you never probably dealt with ones that had radicals underneath them. Still, it's the same idea. Is x to the fourth a perfect square? Well, yeah, sure, it's x squared times x squared. So I'm going to break 18x to the fourth into 9x to the fourth times 2. Right? And then I can break that based on that exponent property. I can apply the 1 half exponent to 9x to the 4th and then apply it separately to the 2. This then can simplify. The square root of 9 is 3 and the square root of x to the 4th is x squared. But there's nothing I can do with the 2. So there it is. All right. Now let's take a look at this. Well, all right, 200. Let's think about this for a second. The biggest perfect square that goes into 200 is 100. Okay. Now, x to the fifth. Uh, yeah, not really. But as we just saw, we can simplify x to the fourth. And although we can't really take the square root of y to the third, we can take the square root of y to the second. But what does that leave me? That leaves me with 2xy. Right? Again, I'm just breaking that product into things I can take the square root of and things I can't take the square root of. Then I'll break it into two separate square roots by applying that exponent property to both parts of that product. Now the square root of 100 is 10, the square root of x to the fourth is x squared, and the square root of y squared is y. And then this is left as it is. Now I bet by now you've probably figured out, right, that I can take the square root of anything that has an even power, right, any variable that is, and that kind of makes sense, right? So the square root of x to the 16th would be x to the 8th. Now you have to be a little careful though with something like this, not with the 147, it just is what it is, but with the x to the 9th, because it would be very easy to think that the square root of x to the ninth is x to the third. But it's not, right? Because x to the third times x to the third is x to the sixth, not x to the ninth. So we have to be we have to be somewhat careful, right? Make sure that we really get this. Now the 147, that's kind of an annoying number. And what you literally do is you sit there and you divide it by four, although it's not even, so there's no way four goes into it. But then you can divide it by nine, 16, 25, 36, 49. And you wanna do that until you find the largest number that goes in there. That happens to be 49. Many students will start to break it up just immediately. They'll say, well, I figured out 49 went in there and it went in three times. Now again, x to the ninth, you're kind of out of luck on. But you can take the square root of x to the eighth, and that would leave you with an x to the first there. And you can certainly take the square root of y to the fourth, it just doesn't leave you anything there. That's okay. Square root of 49 then is 7. The square root of x to the eighth is x to the fourth. The square root of y to the fourth is y to the second. And then we have the 3x. I always tell my students, take the square root of what you can and leave what you can't underneath the radical.
right? And there they are. Now, we're going to be going on to cubed roots, fourth roots, fifth roots, etc. in a moment, so make sure you really look at this and think about it. All right, let's clear it out. Of course, as you move up with roots, third roots, fourth roots, fifth roots, it becomes harder. You know, it becomes much harder. And let's take a look at cubed roots first. All right. Now, again, just kind of like with square roots, what you want to be doing with cubed roots is you want to be thinking about perfect cubes, like 2 cubed is 8, 3 cubed is 27, 4 cubed is 64, 5 cubed is 125, etc. Now, again, look at how quickly these things grow. These are what we're looking for. These are the numbers we're going to be taking the cubed root of. So when we look at something like the cubed root of 16, it's pretty obvious that 8 goes into it. We're going to then break that down as the cubed root of 8 times the cubed root of 2. Again, we can find that. The cubed root of 8 is 2, and then we have to leave that. 2 times the cubed root of 2. Now, 108, again, you know, you sit here, you play around with it, you work on it. Um, and what you'll find is you'll find that 27 goes into 108. Okay, so you'll break that down as the cubed root of 27, and it goes in there four times, cubed root of four. Very important that you're tucking this little three in there. Don't make it look like this. That's three times the square root of four. You don't want that. In fact, we'll do that. Just emphasize it. Anyway, the cube root of 27, we can do that. That's 3. And there's not much we can do with that. Except for perhaps not have a fourth root in there. Let's see if this is small enough that I can actually erase it. Ooh, it is small enough. After saying, make sure you've got the right root in there. All right, how about you try to simplify the cube root of 250? All right. Well, when you look at these numbers, the first one that goes in is 125, and in fact, we'll have the cubed root of 125 times the cubed root of 2. The cubed root of 125 is 5, and there's nothing we can do with the cubed root of 2. There it is. Now, let's take a look at this last one. The cubed root of 128 times x to the 8th. Well, Always tackle the number first. And that is definitely 64 and 2. Now, let's talk about, let me let me put it down here, the cubed root of oops, of x to the eighth. Let's try to get rid of that. Let's talk about the cubed root of x to the eighth. Don't ever forget that those roots can always be put back into fractional powers if you'd like. So the cubed root of x to the 8th would be x to the 8th thirds. Well, that's not nice, right? In fact, that would, in a mixed number, that would be like, what, x squared? Well, it would be x to the 2 and 2 thirds if you made 8 thirds into a, a mixed fraction, all right? But that's, that's not simplifying nicely, right? We want x to just some whole number power. Now, if you think about that, that means whatever number is in here, you want it to be divisible by 3, right? And the largest number, less than 8, that's divisible by 3 is x to the 6th. There's a little cubed root in there, x to the 6th. And that leaves us with x squared over here. So what do we get? The cubed root of 64 is 4. And the cubed root of x to the 6th is x squared. Think about that, right? x squared times x squared times x squared equals x to the 6th. And again, you could also just blindly apply the exponent property. x to the 6th to the 1 3rd is x to the 6th times 1 3rd, which is x squared. Now again, that's what all of this simplifies to, and there's nothing we can do with that by design. So let me circle that in red because it's pretty hard to see what the right answer is. There it is. All right. Now, in order to do even 
higher level work. I got to erase some of this. Excellent. Let's go back to that. Wow, fourth roots. All right. Well, with fourth roots, we want to be thinking along these lines. Two to the fourth is 16. Three to the fourth is 81. Four to the fourth is, what's four to the fourth? See, I don't even know this one. Four to the fourth is 256, right? Five to the fourth, etc. So you want to have these numbers. All right, let's take a look at the fourth root of 162. So I sit here and I kind of divide these in and very quickly, you know, I'm going to see it's going to be this one, right? In fact, I'm going to have the fourth root of 81 times the fourth root of two. The fourth root of 81 is three, and the fourth root of two, I'm just gonna leave. So three times the fourth root of two. On the other hand, this one simplifies very nicely. Do you see why? Think about what F simplifies to be. It simplifies completely, so to speak, right? because I can find the fourth root of 16, but I can also find the fourth root of x to the eighth, right? The fourth root of 16 is gonna be two, and the fourth root of x to the eighth is gonna be x squared. Again, think about that, right? If I have x to the eighth to the one fourth, and I multiply these two powers, I get two x squared. Sorry, but I need the root. Back to here. All right, the fourth root of 48 x to the 10th y to the fifth. Pause the video now and see if you can simplify this. Okay, let's go through it. If you can simplify this, it means you're well on your way to understanding how these things work. All right, so everything we can take the fourth root of, well, 16, now, x to the 10th, well, just like with cubed roots, with fourth roots, I'm only going to be able to take the fourth root of a power that is divisible by 4. So x to the 8th, y to the 4th. What's left underneath this other fourth root? Underneath this fourth root? That doesn't look like a 4. Anyway, underneath this fourth root, I really feel the need to like try to make this look better, which is understandable. There we go. Underneath that fourth root, we're left with a 3, we're left with an x squared, and we're left with a y to the first. So what do we have left? Well, the fourth root of 16 is 2. The fourth root of x to the eighth is x to the second. The fourth root of y to the fourth is y. And then this is left underneath that radical. All right, once we get up to things like fifth roots, which is what we have in this last problem, you know, then the numerical part gets just a little bit silly, right? Two to the fifth is 32. Three to the fifth is 720. I, gotta, I actually have to look this up. Three to the fifth is 243, etc. So pretty quickly, these things get very, very large. And in fact, Right? The fifth root of 64 can be broken down as 32 and 2. Right? Now, think about it. x to the 12th. Well, I'm going to have an x to the 10th. And then over here, an x squared. y to the 15th, though, I'll be able to find its fifth root. Right? Just like before, I'll be able to find the fifth root of any variable raised to a power divisible by 5. So the fifth root of 32 is 2. The fifth root of x to the 10th is x squared. The fifth root of y to the 15th is y to the 3rd. And then we have the fifth root of 2x squared left. And that's that. Oh, I know those last few were probably pretty, pretty rough. All right, but what you have to do is you have to have those lists of perfect squares, perfect cubes, and perfect fourth and fifths out in front of you. All right, that'll help you with the numerical part. 
I hope the variable part though makes a lot of sense in terms of you know what kind of variable powers, what kind of powers on variables you'll be able to find square roots, third roots, fourth roots for. All right, but get some practice on it on the homework. Pause the video now and write down anything you need to. Okay, let's clear out the text. And let's wrap it up. So today we re-reviewed re the basic notion of a unit fraction defining a root, or a root defining a unit fraction exponent. All right. From that, then, we were able to extend to exponents like 3 halves, 7 thirds, negative 5 fourths, stuff like that. Finally, we use the properties of exponents, both fractional and just normal exponents, in order to understand how we simplify square roots, cubed roots, fourth roots, etc. All right. I'd like to thank you for joining me for another Common Core Algebra 2 lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler, and until next time, keep thinking and keep solving problems.